This episode could be triggering for sensitive listeners and contains mature content. It may not be suitable to all listeners. Should you need any emotional assistance, please see the show notes for telephone numbers that you can call. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are my own and do not reflect the official policy or position of the podcast. Any content provided by contributors such as the host, guests, bloggers, sponsors or authors are of their opinion and are not intended to malign any religion, group, club, organization, company, individual or anyone or anything. One hundred and twenty three kilometers from Durban, in the lush valley of a thousand hills, in the district of Zululand in KwaZulu Natal, lies the Kwasi Zabantu mission. Kwasi Zabantu is Zulu for the place where people are helped. According to ksb.org.za, Kwasi Zabantu is a non denominational Christian mission station that reaches out to people of all racial and cultural groups bringing a message of repentance and hope, and providing spiritual guidance, educational support, and counseling. The Kwasi Zabantu ministry originated in South Africa, but has expanded to include centers in several countries. The mission station is situated between Greytown and Stanga, Kwadukuza, in KwaZulu-Natal, and currently is one of the largest mission stations in Africa. People from all walks of life visit the mission. Many receive help with personal and addiction problems. The mission has a number of non-profit initiatives and successful commercial enterprises which provide funds for activities and education facilities. This is Geek Coding Cult and I'm your host Palsy. You are listening to the Kwasi Zabantu Mission Part 1. In this episode, I'm going to provide a little background on the Zulu people and the political climate in South Africa around the time when the mission started. We will then go into the background of the leader of the Kwasi Zabantu mission and how the mission grew. Thousands of years ago, African tribes started migrating from West Africa. This would be around where modern-day Nigeria and Cameroon are situated. Some of these tribes migrated east towards the Nile Basin and the Great Lakes area. The Nguni people's ancestors are said to have migrated south along the eastern coast of Africa. In South Africa, the Nguni people comprise of the Ndebele, Swazi, Koza and Zulu. The Zulu people settled in what is now known as KwaZulu-Natal, or KZN. Currently, they are the largest ethnic group and nation in South Africa, between 10 and 12 million people. They mainly still live in KZN, and they speak Isi Zulu. The word Zulu means heaven or sky, and Zulu people often refer to themselves as the people from the heavens. The Zulus have a beautifully rich culture. For the purposes of this episode, I will be focusing on some of their beliefs, but I do encourage you to please look into their culture. The Zulu people believe that there are different elements that make up human beings. They have a body, or umzimba, and a soul, or itlozi. They also believe that there is the heart, or feelings, called the inclusio, and the brain, mind, and understanding, which is called inkondo. And finally, there is Isitunzi, which is the shadow or personality. They have great reverence for their ancestors and believe that they guide and help them through their daily lives. They believe that when a person dies, it should be celebrated as that person will now be joining the ancestors. The entire community comes together to celebrate. When a person dies, all of their elements bar one is left behind. The Isi Tunzi, or Shadow, moves on to join the ancestors. 
This, however, will only happen once they perform the Ukubuyisa ceremony. This ceremony occurs one year after the death of the individual and calls the spirit back home to live among their ancestors. The ancestors are said to be very powerful and are believed to even have the ability to control the forces of nature. Furthermore, they believe that there is one all-powerful supernatural being called Nkulunkulu, who is similar to the Christian god. It is said that Nkulunkulu was created in a big bed of reeds called Unklanga, which means the source of all things, before he descended to earth. When he came to earth, he created all of the animals, mountains, the sun, the moon, the water and the humans. He is seen as the first man and ancestor. He taught his people how to hunt, make fire and grow food. People do not have direct access to Unkulunkulu, but do however have their ancestors who are the connection between the two. Zulu people are also very superstitious and believe that their ancestors come to them in various ways, like dreams, sickness, or even animals such as snakes. When good things happen, such as an abundance of food, little sickness, or when a boy reaches puberty, they perform ugubonga. This is a thanksgiving ritual. In cases where things seem to go wrong all of the time, or when a person dies unexpectedly, they hold ukuteta, which is a scolding ritual. Both rituals are performed by sacrificing either cattle or goats according to the respective ritual and under the strict observation of the procedure and protocol. When people get sick or have a run of bad luck, they turn to their traditional healers known as sangomas. Traditional healers call on a combination of their ability to commune with their ancestors and the use of traditional medicine to assist their people. Traditional medicine usually comprises of a mixture of medicinal plants and some animal parts, which is called muti. The sad thing is, there is also a dark side to this, where some practitioners have been known to commit muti murders. This is where they kill a person and use various body parts for their muti. I'm just going to insert a trigger warning here, because the next few seconds deal with children and it's pretty rough. In a 2014 article by The Witness, titled Chilling Horror of Muti, it states that The genitalia of young boys and virgin girls are especially highly prized on account of being uncontaminated by sexual contact. It further goes on to state It is said to be common for human skulls to be buried in the foundations of new buildings to ensure that the business conducted there thrives for body parts to be buried on farms to ensure good harvest, and for severed hands to be built into shop entrances to beckon prospective clients. A human head is sometimes prescribed for a failing business, or if the business is not doing well, you get a boy or a girl's head, someone who has a future, and then your business will have a future too. I just want to put in a disclaimer here that I believe that this is just an exception and I believe that the majority of traditional healers do not practice this and are pillars of their community. I wanted to give you this background because, as we know, some Christians, especially earlier Christians, believe that things outside of their own belief systems were either cults or were seen as witchcraft. This will become important later in the story. The next subject I want to cover before we get into the story of the mission is apartheid which means a partners in Afrikaans. South Africa gained independence from the UK in 1910, and just three years later, they started segregating black South Africans by parting the Land Act, which forced these people to live on reserves and politically and economically discriminated against all non-whites. In 1948, the National Party, led by Dear F. Malan, extended the policy and named it Apartheid. Later, they developed the Population Registration Act of 1950, where all people were classified as either Bantu, which was all black Africans, colored, which were people of mixed race, or white. They would later include another category for Asian, which was Indian and Pakistani. 
The Group Areas Act of 1950 led to the establishment of residential and business sections for each race and members of other races were barred from living in, operating businesses or owning land in these respective areas. Some families were even torn apart, where members within a family may be classified differently and were separated according to their classification. Black people were treated even worse than any other. The government brought in pass laws, which required non-whites to carry documentation known as a dompas, authorizing their presence in restricted areas. Non-whites were given substandard education and were not allowed university access, only ethnic university colleges. There were also laws against interracial marriages and even sex between two different races was banned. Much of the country was demarcated as white only, and non-whites were even told to use separate entrances than those from whites. There are too many atrocities to mention that happened during this time, but by 1985 the UK and the US imposed economic sanctions against South Africa. The international community put a lot of pressure on the country's political leaders and in 1990, then President F. W. de Klerk freed Nelson Mandela. In 1994, our first real democratic elections were held, where the African National Congress got voted into power, and Nelson Mandela became our first black president. By 1996, they had compiled our new constitution and Bill of Rights. Erlo Stegen was born on 2 March 1935 on Fontaine Farm near Durban to Lutheran parents Karl and Ungard, who were the children of German immigrants. Erlo was the fourth of six children, with three older brothers, one younger brother and a younger sister. He was described as a shy and timid child who loved farming. Erlo and his siblings attended the Deutsche Schule Hermannsburg, or Hermannsburg School, which is the oldest private school in the province. Erlo loved sport and was particularly fond of playing tennis. Erlo's youngest brother, Manfred Stegen, stated in a News 24 documentary, Erlo had a unique experience. He was kicked by a young calf on his forehead and he was concussed. And from that day he had terrific headaches. And when he went to Hermannsburg, they sent him home. They said this child is not able to learn. Later on in life, when he went to Bible school, the headaches went away. And to us as a family, that was a miracle. We just, we saw God in it. He loved mission work. He loved working amongst people. All of the Stegan children would eventually become involved in missionary work. By his own account in his writings, Revival Among the Zulus, Erlo states that while other young men of his age were thinking about girls, his mind was focused on making money. He goes on to say that when God called him to the ministry, he was hesitant as he knew that pastors were poor and he didn't want that. He further goes on to say that, quote, I couldn't recall that there had ever been a preacher or missionary in my family line, end quote. I did, however, find a few accounts that his grandparents had come from Germany as missionaries. One account was even on the KSB YouTube channel by his own brother Heino. It is my opinion that he may have said this to make himself stand out, or even make himself feel special. I mean, it could not have been easy to get much attention being one of six siblings. He would also make up excuses when he was invited to events in order to stay home and study the Bible. The Stegan family attended the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Leland Thole, where Reverend Anton Engelbrach was the preacher. Anton Engelbrach was born in Paul Petersburg in KZN in 1905. His parents were religious churchgoers, but he was never particularly interested in faith. This, however, changed for him when he was deeply moved by a particular sermon which centered around the Last Judgment. He decided to become a missionary and went to the Missionary Training Institute in Hermannsburg, Germany from 1927 to 1934. At the training institute, he clashed with a few of his Nazi-sympathizing lecturers 
and was completely against national socialism. After completing his studies, he returned to South Africa and was sent to the Esibongweni Mission Post in KZN. He then moved to the Evangelical Lutheran Church in 1946 due to health reasons. His sermons would become worrisome to some as he would preach fervently against conformity to the world. Those who opposed him would state that he was preaching, quote, exaggerated piety, fanaticism, and perfectionism. In a letter on ksbealert.com, it states about Reverend Anton Engelbrecht's community, quote, which functioned according to the dictatorial structures that reminiscent of sects in every respect, end quote. Reverend Engelbrecht broke from the church in 1951, moved to Pretoria and started a Bible school there. He kept in touch with those in KZN that still very much believed in his teachings and later moved back there to create his own independent congregation. He built a small community in Claridge near Peter Maritzburg. The Stegans followed him there. Erlo would receive his theological training from the Reverend at Claridge Bible House in Pretoria from 1952 to 1953. In Revival Among the Zulus, Ulo goes on to explain that once he had completed his theological training, God showed him that he not only needed to preach to white people, but also to black people. What we need to remember is that this was around the 1940s and 50s in South Africa, and at the time, black people were seen as much less than white people. He, at that time, was of the same opinion as most of the white South Africans, and he did not even speak the language. He only spoke English, Afrikaans and German, but he went out anyway to speak to them. He would later eventually learn to speak Isi Zulu fluently. For 12 years he would preach to the Zulu people, he would go to them on foot and later by bicycle, and for the most part he was met with resistance from them. They would call Christianity the white man's religion, and wanted to stay true to their own beliefs and traditions. Erlo countered their arguments by stating that what they were doing was witchcraft and that they could only be saved if they accepted the Lord as their saviour. He eventually acquired a bucky, a caravan and a large tent. He would travel to various settlements around the country, pitch his tent for a while and preach to the people there. In 1966, he began a Bible study group in Mapumulo in KZN. Mapumulo is about 129 kilometers inland from Durban and around 188 kilometers from Peter Maritzburg. They cleared out a shed on his parents' farm and held two Bible study sessions per day, one at 7 a.m. and one at 5 p.m. Food would also be provided to those who attended the Bible studies. He decided that, instead of taking excerpts from various scriptures to teach the congregation, they would learn each chapter from the beginning to the end. He decided to start with Acts, which is the fifth book in the New Testament. In the Good News Bible, its introduction says in part, quote, An important feature of Acts is the activity of the Holy Spirit, who comes with power upon the believers in Jerusalem on the day of the Pentecost and continues to guide and strengthen the church and its leaders throughout the events reported in the book. The early Christian message is summarized in a number of sermons, and the events recorded in Acts show the power of this message in the lives of the believers and in the fellowship of the church. End quote. Erlo would teach a lot about repenting sin and living a pure life for God. One day, during one of the Bible study sessions, they felt what they described like a great wind that made the shed shake and they knew that in that moment God was among them. On this same day, it was told that the Spirit of God came down on one of the female Zulu congregants called Magas, and she received the gift of tongues. From that day forward, more and more people would come to hear of the Word of God. Ola relates the story of a day where a witch, or as we now know them, a Sangoma, came to them and asked to be saved. She asked them to pray for her so that she could be rid of the evil spirits inside of her. He says that he and some colleagues sat around her on chairs and started singing hymns. The story describes how at first she went down on her hands and knees and thrashed around like a wild animal. Then she started speaking English, 
a language that she allegedly had never known before. Then many dogs started barking from within her, followed by a herd of pigs squealing and grunting from inside her. When the group commanded the evil spirits to leave her, they stated that they were 300 strong and would never leave her. They kept on praying and then, with lots of shouting and screaming, the demons left her body, 100 at a time. Erlo's account states that during the entire process, the Sangoma's face was dark and horrifying, but once she had been released from evil, she looked like a saint. He further goes on to say that following this, many more Sangomas came to be saved by them. There are also accounts of how he had changed families, made fathers more tolerant and children more obedient, and there were also proclamations made that they had healed the sick. Some were healed by just having come to a Bible study. Erlo called this the Zulu Revival. He stated, God had kindled his fire which spread over the mountains and through the valleys of Zululand, so that in one week, in fact in one day, thousands of Zulus were converted. It's usually at this point where I will give you my opinion, but I will let you draw your own conclusions on this for now. As they were still in the middle of the apartheid era, it was hard for the Zulu people to come to the Bible studies, as they needed permission and a pass to be able to go to and from Mapumulo. So Erlo set out to find a place where they could all gather. In 1970, about four kilometers up the road, one of Erlo's brothers purchased a farm called Yamardal and gifted Erlo a portion of the property where all races could go. He called this Kwasi Zabantu. The land comprised of sugarcane and wattle plantations, so they set about clearing out a space on the property. They worked hard leveling the ground and laying the foundation for their first building. People who were there from the beginning would tell stories of how, even though they did not have the money, through prayer and faith, they always managed to get what they needed to complete the next step of their build. When they completed the building, it had a bedroom for Erlo, a kitchen and enough space for 60 additional people to sleep. They set up the tent next to the building where the sermons would be held. They also had a small tuck shop on the property where people could buy some necessities. They continued providing food to all of those who came to the Bible study sessions. The food for this was prepared in huge poiki pots in an outdoor kitchen. They even ploughed a small field and planted potatoes. Up to this time, Erlo was a self-proclaimed proud bachelor, but then he met a young lady named Kay Dahl. She was a teacher from Newcastle and would visit the Stegan family when she had a free weekend. In an interview, one of his brothers said, quote, To me she was, she could have been the only one who was fit and who was brave enough to get into the work and be Erlo's wife. End quote. When one of Erlo's brothers asked her if they get married that she understood that it was God first, then the work, then her, she was happy with this. They got married at the Potterfontaine farm where Erlo had been born. They had six daughters together. During the 1970s, more and more people would flock to the mission and many would stay. They ended up building more dormitories to house the people who came for spiritual guidance. They also constructed rondavals. A rondavel is a circular or oval African-style dwelling. Many years ago, they were constructed from materials which could be found in the area, like stones. Traditionally, the floor was made from a dung mixture to make it hard and smooth, and the roof was made from thatch that was sewn to poles. Nowadays, they are also made from bricks. Most rondavels are basically a singular room, although some have a kitchen nook and some even a small bathroom. Many people would leave their homes and churches to come and work and live at the mission. Erlo started off with six colleagues, but it grew to around 165, with an additional 1,400 residents who live and work at the mission. A few of Erlo's colleagues formed a choir. The big draw about the mission was that it was fully integrated. People of all color and creed were welcome, as long as they opened themselves up to God and His teachings. As you can imagine, this was a huge deal at the time. Sermons would be multilingual. Erlo would either preach in Isi Zulu and then have an English translator, or he would preach in English and would have an Isi Zulu translator. 
In 1973, Erle decided to take his mission work overseas and started in Europe. Oftentimes, the choir would accompany him on his trips. His idea was to let the Europeans share in what he had achieved with the Zulu people. He actually had some success in Europe and gained a group of firm followers in countries such as Germany, the Netherlands and France. Additionally, he would hold summer conferences in Switzerland, which would attract thousands of people who wished to hear about the revival in Zululand. Summer in Europe is winter here in South Africa. In the book, Is This a Genuine Revival? by Albert Pylon, he explains how Erlo managed to gain followers in Europe. Quote, The success that Stegen has enjoyed in Europe is due to the modernization of society which began in the 1960s. Norms and values which had established the basis of society for centuries were abandoned. The Christian church has been drawn into this process and has been forced into the margins of society. The vacuum that has developed seems to be fertile ground for movements of spiritual renewal that originated in other parts of the world. The leaders radiate charisma, have great powers of persuasion, and enjoy unusual authority. End quote. Eventually, Kwasi Zabantu or KSB will have 40 branches in southern Africa and around 20 overseas in Germany, France, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Romania, Belgium, Australia and Russia. The European division would be managed by Friedel Stegen. It was also in 1973 when one of Erlo's very devout followers, 20-year-old Lydia Dube, fell ill and passed away. It is said that a few hours after everyone had accepted her passing, she miraculously came back to life. Okay, I know there are a few of us that are shaking our heads in disbelief here, so I did a little research on this. I found two medical possibilities. First, on Healthline.com, I found Lazarus Syndrome. Lazarus is a biblical figure who was said to have come out of his tomb alive about four days after his death. According to the website, Lazarus Syndrome refers to your blood circulation returning spontaneously after your heart stops beating and fails to restart despite cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR. There was a report compiled in 2015 that found that 32 of these cases were reported between 1982 and 2008, which makes it very rare. It further goes on to say that in most cases, circulation usually returned within 10 minutes of stopping CPR. The second one that I found was a very unusual medical condition called catalepsy. According to the National Center for Biotechnology Information, it is, quote, a condition characterized by inactivity, decreased responsiveness to stimuli, a tendency to maintain an immobile posture, end quote. Catalepsy is sometimes a symptom of epilepsy, and when this occurs, your limbs can remain in the exact position that they were placed at the time and can be mistaken for rigor mortis. I have no idea what kind of medical intervention was given to Lydia, so I cannot say for sure which of these would be the answer, and just being devil's advocate here, maybe it was divine intervention. When Lydia came back, she told people that she had been to heaven, but that the Lord had sent her back. Her mission was to start a fellowship for the youth. She set about planning the fellowship, and the first youth service was held in 1974. Since then, it has become a biannual event held in July and December. The amount of people coming to the services would increase all the time, and when the buildings could not house the quantities any longer, they set up blue and white striped marquee tents to facilitate all of the people. At times, the tents were not even big enough to hold all the congregants, so they would sit in a field and listen to Alu preach. In 1980, they began construction on an auditorium which would house 10,000 people, and it was finally opened in 1990. Sadly, in 2008, due to faulty wiring, the entire building burned to the ground. This time, it only took them one year to rebuild, and the new auditorium was reopened in April of 2009. 
The children who resided at the mission would be bused to school in Kwadukuza, which is about an hour's drive from the mission. It is said that parents started to worry about what their children were being taught in public schools and that they wanted their children to be taught in a moral way. My opinion on this is that just maybe Erlo had preached how immoral the outside world was and that he may even have preached about how bad it was in schools so that the parents would come to this conclusion based on his teachings. I have no proof of this. It is just speculation from my side. But you may understand why I think this later on in the story. Anyway, the mission founded Domino Civite School in 1986 on the property for children of the mission. Civite Domino is Latin for serve the Lord. As Kay, Stegan's wife, was a qualified teacher, she served as the first headmaster of the school. With so many people flocking to the mission, it was costly to house and feed them all. Erlo decided to start businesses that would provide income into the mission in order to help maintain and grow the mission and allow them to assist the surrounding communities without putting too much of a burden on the congregants' pockets. In 1989, they founded KSB Dairy, which would later change its name to Bonlay Dairy in 2003. This company sells yogurt, milk, cream, Mars, and dairy fruit blends. In 1990, they founded Msini Farm. Msini is Isizulu for in grace or place of grace. They have around 10 hectares or 24.7 acres of greenhouses, which produce around 8 tons of sweet bell peppers of all colors per week. They also have a huge orchard with avocado trees. These products are shipped both locally and internationally to retailers. In 1997, a young child shared a vision with Erlo. The child said that the vision had revealed to him that there was great treasure underground at the mission. It was not treasure in the traditional sense. Instead, they found a natural water source. This brought about a quelle bottled water. It started out with just still and sparkling bottled water and then later expanded to flavoured versions. They now also have Viv Sports and Power Drinks, and also Cooler Soft Drinks. In 1994, Kay opened the Cedar Training College of Education. This was established to train Christian teachers. In 1996, Potchefstroom University for Christian Higher Education would agree to offer some of their educational programs using Cedar as a satellite campus. In 2004, the university's name changed to the Northwest University, or NWU. In 2015, the agreement between NWU and CEDA was terminated, and existing students were phased out. CEDA became independent, and its name changed to CEDA International Academy. Knowing that the small kiosk-like store was no longer sufficient to service all of the people in and around the mission, They built Save Right Supermarket in 2011, complete with a butchery and bakery. Besides all of these businesses, they also make pasta, jams and pickles. They have a substance abuse rehabilitation center, a small care facility, a radio station called Radio Quasi, Mseni Care Center for HIV and AIDS patients, Tabita Adult School, where they train illiterate adults to read and write, a coffee shop, pottery and carpentry shop, a printing press, a bakery, kiwi vineyard, and chickens. The mission also invested in a small aeroplane and created an airstrip in the mission as Ulo traveled a lot. It is said that they now own four private planes, including a multi-million rand Pilatus. If you are thinking, as I am, that this doesn't sound all too bad, I mean it has a few quirks, but it sounds kind of idyllic. In our next episode, we will be delving into the beliefs and structures of the mission. Just maybe it may change your mind. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button and rate and review us. It will go a long way into improving the podcast and helping others find it. You can find us on Facebook and you can email us at decodingcults at gmail.com 
we would love to hear from you. If there are any topics around the workings of cult which you would like further explanation on, or if there is a cult that you would like to hear about, email me or post it in the Facebook group. Remember to go and check out By Design Crafts SA and Endeavor AV and tell them that I sent you. I just want to say a big thank you to all of my listeners in Australia. I really appreciate you. The amazing logo art was created by the tattoo artist Jock Jacobs. Thank you so much for listening.